Good morning and welcome to Hell's Eye Free Methodist Church. Our call to worship on this Christ the King Sunday is from Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want, I, not, I shall not be in want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. Um, he restores my soul. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his namesake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Let us worship Jesus Christ, our King. Good morning, everyone. I uh, want to thank the Lord for giving us the resilience and the, uh, the technology to do what, what we're about to do today to glorify him. And uh, I prayed really hard about what to bring the Lord for worship today. And, um, and he gave me a lot of words. And one of the words were, was um, familiar. One of the words was fresh. Um, so we're gonna have some fresh worship today. We're gonna have some familiar worship today. And we're going to have some fitting worship today. And I felt that this song was fitting with what we're going through in the world, not just in the United States, but the world. Sometimes we don't look at it. And God is in control. Sometimes we forget his promises. His promises that if we seek him first, everything else will be added on to us, not only us, but all Americans and all people around the world. So we need to seek him first. So. Today, I want to stand on those promises with, with an older Methodist hymn and just have some fun with it. Standing on the promises of Christ my King, standing on the church to praise His reign, glory in the highest I will shout and sing, standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing, standing on the cross to depress my Savior. Standing, standing, standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises of God. Then the howling storms of doubt and fear of sin. Then the word of God I shall prevail. Standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing, standing, standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises I now can see. Well, because of cleansing of the blood for me. Standing in the liberty of Christ makes free. Standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises of God, standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, standing on the promises of Christ alone. Down to Him eternally by love's strong hold, overcome the devil with His spirit soul. Standing on the promises of God, standing, standing. Standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing, standing, standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises of God, my Lord. The one who ever knew the day I was called. Him as my Savior, as my all Standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing, standing on the promises of God. 
and sing that chorus one more time. Standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing, standing, standing on the promises of God. During our prayer time today, we are going to look at two more of the great and precious promises of God, promised escape and promised prompting. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says, no temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. In promising us everything related to life and godliness, God has first taken care of the three biggest issues, salvation, sin, and temptation. All humans experience them in reverse order, first being tempted, then sinning, then accepting salvation. But God deals with them by saving us, forgiving our sin, and giving us a way out of temptation. His mercies undo the trouble we got ourselves into. But while we are quick to embrace the benefits of salvation, and almost as quick to accept the ongoing forgiveness he offers, we are less diligent about addressing temptation. After all, if God has forgiven us and is going to continue to forgive us for everything we have ever done or ever will do, why should we get hung up on temptation? Whether we commit the sin or not, we're forgiven, right? We are, but that's not the point. God has redeemed us for a new life, and temptation wars against that new life. When we give into it, it threatens the blessings God wants to bestow on us. It undermines our process of conforming to Jesus, and it slanders the one who says he saved us and cleansed us of all unrighteousness. Giving into temptation makes a statement about the power of the God we serve. It calls into question his ability to keep his people. God's power is not insufficient. The fault lies entirely with us. He has given us a way out of temptation every single time. He will never allow us to be tempted beyond what we can bear. Most of us will have a dual reaction to this promise. We will be comforted that we never have to be overwhelmed by temptation. We will also be exposed every time we claim we were overwhelmed by it. God's promise gives us a way out and it also holds us accountable. That's both encouraging and convicting. In either case, it's a call to a purer, more godly life with a promise to help us in it. And that leads us to Philippians chapter 2, verse 13. For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. God is at work in us. He does not tell us to conform to the image of Jesus and then leave us alone to do it. He does not send us out on a mission and then cross his fingers for our success. He does not urge us to live godly lives and then blow up when we fail. No, every step of the way he is there. And as this verse indicates, he is not just working on our behavior from the outside. He is transforming us from within. That's what it means for God to work in us to will and to act according to his good purpose. His values shape our will our inner drives, our ambitions and dreams. And then his spirit helps us with the follow through, acting on those inner impulses that he has placed within us. Far from being handed a religion that tells us to shape up, we are handed a savior who gets inside to shape us. The promise of transformation is that God is busy gutting our temple and renovating it from within. He's a master craftsman at work. The comforting part of this promise 
is that when we have deep internal desires to do something entirely consistent with the stated purpose and plan of God, those desires are probably God-given. And when we are driven to act on those desires with a strategy and a worthwhile agenda, we are likely driven by God himself. Once our prayers have determined that we're motivated by the spirit and not by the flesh, we can trust that our work is not just our agenda, but also his. That means he will see it through. The sovereign God who sees the future doesn't abandon projects midway through. If he started his good work in you, he's committed to it. Rest in that truth and trust what he is doing in your heart. There is a holy agenda shaping your life. During our online audio worship, we really haven't had a moment to uh, pray quietly and silently like we did when we were in the sanctuary. It's kind of awkward to have just audio silence. But today, because we're on Zoom Live and we can see each other, we're going to take a moment to just bow your heads, be silent, and reflect on God's great and precious promises to help us when we're tempted and of his work in us to transform us into his image. So let us be silent for just a few seconds. Lord God Almighty, we come before you with thanksgiving and gratitude for your great and precious promises. If not for these wonderful promises, we would be lost and have no hope. But you, sovereign God, you always keep your promises. We are saved and forgiven by the precious blood of our Lord Jesus, redeemed at great cost. Our circumstances and the things around us change, but you remain the same forever. Continue to work in us to stand firm in our faith in you and to not yield to the temptations that come upon us with each new day. Help us to lead a more godly life so that we will bring you all the honor and glory you deserve. Let us live in such a way that our words and actions represent you so that our message may be one of love and hope. Amen. Join me in saying the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. And in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of the saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. And when it comes to worship songs, I listen to a lot of the Christian worship radio stations and songs come and go and sometimes I don't hear the words and this song's been out for quite a while now and I just recently a week or so ago started listening to the words wholeheartedly and I just fell in love with it so we haven't heard it in church and I don't know if you listen to the contemporary uh, stations or not but if you haven't heard this song they don't really really penetrate you because it's people that we believe in something that we can't see, that we can't hear, that we can feel. You don't answer all my questions. Do you hear me when I speak? You don't keep my heart from breaking when it does you weep with me. 
Your souls that I can feel you when I've lost the words to pray. And though my eyes have never seen you, I've seen enough to see. I know that you are good. I know that you are kind. I know that you are so much more than what I leave behind. I know that I am loved. I know that I am safe. Cause even in the fight to live in Christ, to die is gain. I know that you are I don't understand the sorrow But you come within the storm Sometimes the weight is overwhelming But I don't carry it anymore You're so close and I can feel you. I don't have to be afraid. And though my eyes have never seen you, I've seen enough to see. I know that you are good. I know that you are good. you are so much more than what I leave behind. I know that I am loved. I know that I am saved. Cause even in the fight to live in Christ, to die in this game. I know that you are good On my darkest day On my deepest pain Through it all My heart will choose to pray On my darkest day, on my deepest pain, through it all, my heart will choose to praise. I know that you are good. I know that you are Good morning, everybody. Well, have you ever had a experience where you were working and you put in all this work into something and the response you got was ungratefulness, not even a thank you, just an okay, you were supposed to do that anyways. I mean, that's kind of what happened to me over the summer when I was painting at Trinity International University, which I see some alum here uh, in the crowd. Um, yeah, like for example, there was a time I painted someone's room and it was like someone like punched a hole in the wall or whatever and made it look nice. And the response from the student was just, I just said, hey, have a nice day. Typically you get a thank you and just staring at me and no response and just kind of like, hey, out your, your way out the doors over there. And I'm like, I should have just taken the whole bottle of paint, just splash it over his wall and left, right? And then, I mean, there was even one time I, I was painting at the gym at Trinity and the first response from the security guard was, are you done yet? 
And it's like, oh, gee, thank you. I just started actually. Mm -hmm. And it's just sometimes people have different reasons why they just don't give you gratitude or thanks. But in our scripture passage today, that's what happens to Jesus is that Jesus does a good deed for 10 people and only one person comes back to give him thanks. So let us all turn to the to, to the word of the Lord in those holy scriptures. Turn with me to uh, Luke chapter 17. Luke chapter 17, we'll talk about um, from verses 11 to 19. Luke chapter 17, verse 11 to 19. That was the scripture reading in the liturgical calendar for Thanksgiving. And I'm just moving it to this Sunday. And that's why I titled the sermon, Thinking Christ the King. So it's a little synthesis there of Thanksgiving coming up this week and also Christ the King Sunday. And how fitting, right, is that the key of the story here is to thank Christ the King. And we're gonna have a time of responsive prayer as a congregation to thank, thank Christ the King. That's the trajectory we're going today with this sermon is that we are going to thank Jesus through prayer. And we're gonna have an opportunity to respond to that. So Luke chapter 17, starting in verse 11. Now on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus, tra Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. As he was going into a village, 10 men who had leprosy met him. They stood at a distance and called out in a loud voice, Jesus, master, have pity on us. When he saw them, he said, go, show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. One of them, when he saw he was healed, came back, praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. And he was a Samaritan. Jesus asked, were not all 10 cleansed? Where are the other nine? Was no one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, rise and go. Your faith has made you well. All right, so here in the Gospel of Luke, we have Jesus on his way to Jerusalem, as it says here in verse 11, that Jesus is preparing himself for his passion. But before he stops at his destination, he has things to do along the way. And as we see in this context here in chapter 17, you see even starting in, verse, in uh, chapter 15 of the Gospel of Luke, Jesus has his teachings on money and wealth in uh, 15 and 16, especially with the parable of the shrewd manager and in the parable of the rich man and Lazarus and how Jesus is looking for true faith on the earth, right? That those with the true faith will follow Jesus and those with true faith will love Jesus and live sacrificially for them, even if that means giving up status and wealth in the world for the greater glory of God in the kingdom of God. And here we see is that as Jesus is, is traveling in his ministry, he comes across 10 men with leprosy, leprosy, that contagious skin disease that where your body parts begin to fall off. And when you are, have leprosy, you are ritually unclean, so you cannot worship at the temple. So you're you know, ceremonially unclean from going to church or to worship at the temple. And also you're a, you're a social outcast because you are unclean, you are you know, sick. So as you see here in verse 12, it says that these people, they even stood at a distance to Jesus. So they were talking to Jesus in a, in a time of where they had the social distance. So, I mean, can we resonate with that in this time maybe? So here you see that Jesus sees these contagious people who are sick and he's supposed to distance from them. And Jesus hears them, hears them loud and clear what they're basically just yelling at Jesus. You know, many of us, we talk about Jesus like in a quiet voice, but you see here in this Bible story, people are yelling at Jesus. I mean, is it okay for us to yell at Jesus? Well, it depends what you're yelling and listen to their plea here. They, they say Jesus, right? Addressing him by the personal name, Jesus, getting his attention. Master, wow, they already have a respect for Jesus that he's not just some dude teaching, you know? It's not just, a, it's just, he, he is a master. Like they view him as the Messiah already or the Lord. And he said, have, have pity on us. Just a simple request. Have pity on us. Lord, have mercy on us. 
like we pray in church over and over, Lord, have mercy on us. We ask that so much. We say that so much in our liturgy, but in this case, these people said it in this real life situation saying, Lord, have mercy on us. And I think that's what our prayers as we pray to Jesus should be centered on is that Lord, have mercy on us. And what does mercy enacted by God look like in this story? Well, here in this story, as we see here in uh, verse 14, Jesus doesn't heal them right away. It wasn't like instantaneously, poof, you're healed, your skin disease is gone, you know, like with a magic wand. And that's kind of what we expect, like Jesus, you're all powerful, but Jesus, his healings are kind of um, very, very uh, distinct and unique in, in their own case. And here he says, go and show yourselves to the priest. So basically make a, make a trip, make a journey to the religious leaders and to these religious officials, priests, and to show them that you will be cleansed. So it's kind of like this act of faith, Jesus saying, go and leave and go on this journey to go see the, you know, the priest down the road. And as you go, they were, they were cleansed. So, I mean, why that's the case, I don't know, but we see here the power of God, that Jesus was faithful and he, he, he answered the request of these 10 lepers. He had mercy on them. He cleansed them. And that's kind of what we have to ask ourselves today as fellow Christians is that when the Lord showed mercy to us, it's kind of like a cleansing, like how Jesus cleansed the lepers. And what did that look like for you and for me and for us in our experience? It's good to remember those times because it's those times that we remember God's mercy. And like we talk about in the song, stand on the promises of God, that when times are tough, we stand firm in the Lord and our faith doesn't waver. All right. And here in verse 15, it says that although these people got miraculously healed as they were you know, going to the priest and they clearly witnessed a miracle and even shared it with someone else, only one came back to thank Jesus. But how did he thank Jesus? I mean, here in the Bible, it says he came back praising God in a loud, loud voice. There he goes shouting again to God. So here you see in this passage, a very positive example of shouting and yelling at Jesus. Now that may not be necessary for today's Zoom meeting, but just that kind of sense of desperation and need for Jesus shows such true and authentic faith that we need to emulate and be like this Samaritan in the story. He comes back praising God and glorifying God in a loud voice. Like he's excited about what's happening and, and his life is gonna change in a new direction now. He's no longer a social outcast no longer ritually unclean, can worship at the temple and be a part of society. What's his response? I mean, we, we know about the nine who didn't come back was that they didn't give thanks, but we don't know what the reasons were. We can think of, we can all think of nine different excuses we can give why we don't need to thank Jesus. You know, it's kind of like what I pointed out about the paintings. Like you don't, do we really need to thank the painter? You know, interesting thing about painting was that I can't remember all the times people said thank you to me, but I can remember all the times that people didn't say thank you to me. That sticks out because when people say thank you to you, that's a normal day. That's just, you know, Monday. But then when someone like doesn't say thank you to you, it's like someone ruining your Friday. And it's like that just, and Jesus, Jesus is even hurt by that. He's like, why is there what, nine other, where's the nine other people? And of the one person who came back, the only one who came back wasn't even Jewish. He was Samaritan, like a half breed. And he's worshiping at a different temple. And you know, the Samaritans, although they were like neighbors of Israel, they were part of ancient Israel. They were, you know, mixed breed with the Gentiles. So ethnically not fully Jewish. And then they had their own, um, their own religious system. They had their own temple and even their own form of scriptures from the Bible. And they were just viewed as like, you know, ethnically inferior but also religious heretics and yet this person in the story is the one the Samaritan receives mercy from Jesus and he's the one who bothers to come back to give thanks to Jesus and he's our role model of good faith on the earth is that this Samaritan is a sign of what good faith on the earth looks like about someone who's ready to follow Jesus is that all of us have had an experience as born-again Christians who we passed 
from death to life. And that was like the cleansing experience that Jesus gets us. And because of that, we, we have to follow Jesus now as his disciples. And we give thanks, you know, not just a one time thank you, Jesus, and never see him again, but we follow him with our whole life as an elongated thank you to Jesus, as our whole life is a whole big thank you, Jesus. You know, what does it mean to be a Christian is to thank Jesus with your whole life for cleansing you. And how we see that leprosy, although it was a skin disease, is also like a sign for, for sin because we know that Jesus can clean things on the exterior, you know, on skin diseases, but Jesus can clean the most fundamental spiritual problem, which is sin. And that's why he came to die on the cross for us. And that we can all stand firm to say that, yes, thank you, Jesus, for healing us from sin, which is the ultimate disease that causes death. And that's what we need to remember and come together when we worship Jesus is that, is that we are here to give thanks to Jesus for dying on the cross for our sins. As fundamental as that sounds, we always have to remind ourselves of the gospel because like even when we do the Lord's Supper, the Lord's Table communion that we do once a, once a month, that's a time for us to remind ourselves of the gospel is that Jesus, he died for us and he resurrects, he resurrected for us and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty as we affirm in the Apostles' Creed. And that we always remind ourselves is that God is faithful and that God has cleansed us as he cleansed this leper. And we are here to say thank you. Like even the word like Eucharist, the word used for the Lord's table in the Greek word comes from like to give thanks, like thanksgiving. That when we come to the Lord's table, it's a time to give thanks. And when we come together, it's not just on Thanksgiving Sunday or Christ the King Sunday that we give thanks. And you know, how fitting for today, but every day we should be giving thanks to Jesus. And we need to share with each other how we give thanks to Jesus. All right. So I think I want to want to point out here from the story is about the, 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 the healing of Jesus, right? Is that as Christians, we can ask Jesus for healing, right? We can ask him in prayer to heal us. If we feel like we have a sickness or an ailment, as Christians, we should boldly approach the throne of grace and ask the prayer from the church to, to pray. And that's what we see here. But also ultimately is that we should not be so superficial like these nine Jewish people who didn't return to give thanks to Jesus. They all had an excuse to not thank Jesus, to not bother to make the trip back and say a simple thank you. And we have to ask ourselves, what gives people so much ingratitude for what God does for us. I mean, if you, I mean, think about all the things that God does for human beings, whether they're saved or not, you know, Christians or not, that God does so many good things for us in the creation and also in a special way when Jesus dies for the sins of the world. And, and God is offering, you know, physical healing that we pray for, it doesn't always give it, but the spiritual healing to be saved by grace from our sins, God will always give that. And that's the most important thing is that we are here when we worship to give thanks to God for our salvation, for what God has done for us. And that, you know, that this Lord, this Christ, the King that we worship is faithful on his promises to save us. Like John three sixteen, we talked about in our prayer time previously, is that those who believe in Jesus, you know, and the only begotten son of God, Jesus, they will be saved. There's a promise there in that verse for salvation that we believe in Jesus, we will be saved and that we serve a faithful God who does not let us down, right? And I think that's, that's why we gather together to pray to thank Jesus is because he hasn't let us down yet and he'll never let us down. And that's the interesting and the wonderful, amazing thing about Jesus is that he doesn't let us down in the story. The people who let us down in the story are those who are ungrateful. And yet Jesus still did a great work for them. So how we need to learn from the Samaritan here is that we need to testify for Jesus. I mean, it's nice to write it down in your private journal that Jesus did something for you. He answered a prayer. Or maybe you just tell someone in your immediate family what Jesus did for you. But look at this uh, Samaritan here is that like it says here in verse 15, he came back praising God with a loud voice, that this Samaritan praised God in a public way. 
that when he did it in a public way, it got people's attention that, you know, people talked about and they wrote it down. So it's okay to publicly declare the praises of God in whatever social setting, you know, is provided for us and the opportunities that are open. It is good to publicly praise the Lord like this Samaritan here. So people can know about Jesus so that people can know what's going on that they can catch the word because you know, those of us, we believe in the gospel, we have nothing to hide from the world. We have no hidden agenda, no secret message. It's a public message of God's love for the world. So we, we have something to say, you know, from the rooftops. And we need to testify to Jesus. And, you know, what better way than us to come together as the church right now to thank Jesus in prayer. So I want to prepare us for prayer, that's the intention of this sermon today, is that as we reflect on Christ the King, who heals us from, from physical ailments and even the spiritual ailment of sin, Jesus our Savior the King, that we prepare our hearts and begin to think about all the things that God has done for us. And we begin to think about all the things that Jesus has done for us, what he's done for the Samaritan here, but what he has done in your life as a Christian you are in Christ. How did you experience this cleansing of Jesus? How did you experience the mercy of Jesus? And what was it like when you received the Holy Spirit and that gave you that confidence and boost to proclaim and glorify God, even publicly? So let us all prepare our hearts to pray and think about all the things that Jesus has done for you in your individual life even you and your home, your family life, what Jesus has done for our church here at Hillside, what church is, what God is doing in the Free Methodist Church, the Evangelical Church, the whole church, you know, universal, the church Catholic, that what is God doing around the world? There is so much to give thanks to Jesus for. We can't be like these nine forgetful Jews who had an excuse why they didn't need to thank Jesus, and we don't need to entertain excuses. We just need to come back, simply thank Jesus, and he will guide us. This is not a time to think for excuses, okay? So I will pray, and um, we'll open up the floor for those to pray. And um, Brad, when you feel like everyone who wanted to pray prays, um, Brad, then you can go ahead and pray and transition into the song. Sound good? All right. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your message this morning and reminding us about the mercy of Jesus. Thank you for the story of the, of the 10 lepers. It was unfortunate that nine were ungrateful and didn't come back, but one did. The Samaritan, the outcast, the unclean one, he experienced your mercy, Lord. Let us all be like this Samaritan to witness your mercy to others, to testify that, Lord. And Lord Jesus, we just thank you for what you're doing in our lives and what you're doing here at Hillside, connecting us through Zoom and technology so we can still communicate with each other. And Lord, we know that you're, you're still working in this congregation. We thank you for sending a new superintendent and Jerry to help us and to move us forward into the future. Lord, help us all to humbly and thankfully follow you and to show you gratitude with our lives and to each other, to always encourage each other during these dark and depressing times, even during a season of death, we can still stand on your firm promises, Lord Jesus. You are a king, you stand sovereign on the throne, and Lord, you deliver on your promises. So Lord, let us stand firmly in you and testify about that to each other. So we thank you, Lord Jesus. In your holy name we pray, amen. Amen. Dear Father, I thank you for the, all of us who are gathered here this morning to see the faces, uh, to see their names. I particularly thank you for uh, Sharon being with us and in co continuing the healing of her body. Um, it's such a blessing to know uh, that she's in our midst. This morning, my prayer is one of giving thanks. 
I give God thanks for sparing my life to see another day. I would also like to give God thanks for my church family whose prayers sustain me during my surgery and recovery. I continue to pray for our church and others who are in need or seeking for peace. I give thanks this morning for life because it is a gift from God that should be cherished. Amen. Holy Father, I praise you and thank you for your goodness and kindness and for uh, all the very wonderful things you have done in each of our lives. I'm sure that, that uh, many here have been blessed too, as I have been, by your kindness and goodness and mercy. We thank you and we praise you. And uh, we thank that we, we ask that you can. Uh, keep us growing in love for you and um, in obedience. We ask this in our Lord's name. Amen. Dear Gracious Father, I thank you for your salvation. I thank you for my family. I thank you for the assurances um, that um, my father, who um, died um, back in March, um, is with you and with all of those who died in, in faith um, before him. And Lord, I thank you for um, your call on my life and how, how you have worked through me to... Um, be a blessing to others, to um, to be a listening ear, to be a, a compassionate voice. Um, just the countless ways, Lord, that I've seen you at work um, because of my call. And um, Lord, I do thank you for um, Hillside Church and um, all the people who are part of it and have been a part of it. Lord, there have just been so many blessings um, that have come to my life and to my family's lives um, because of the people of this church. And um, I'm just deeply, deeply grateful for, um, for all those who have been um, working so hard during this transition to um, keep things going and even to um, seek for ways to move forward. I thank you for all those who have been involved with the technical side of things, um, which is completely beyond me. And um, I just thank you for your continued presence, um, for your Holy Spirit that reminds us of your word, that strengthens us, um, during our challenges and comforts us in our sorrows. And um, reminds us of your word and your character and uh, your loving kindness. Uh, thank you for also my life, Lord, and for the answered prayer for Sharon, uh, for the miracle of um, um, Virgil and his um, soon to come baby sister. Um, Lord, you are wondrous and great and um, we trust in you in all things and for all things in Jesus name. Know what your plans for I, for 
us for as a church. And you allow good. You allow uncertainty. You allow your lessons as a guide for us to learn to get back onto your path. And so when I think of this church, I can think of almost every single person I know in this church who have reached out and pulled back onto your path, Lord. And I thank you for that. I thank you for that power. I thank you for that, for that love, for that blessing, for that mercy. You just never know this. And I pray that you just continue to teach us, continue to guide us, continue to bless us. And allow this church to do what your will is for us. Not what we want to do, but for what you want us to fulfill. Splendor the king Golden majesty Let all the earth rejoice All the earth rejoice He wraps himself in light And the darkness tries to hide And trembles at his voice Trembles at his voice How great is our God Sing with me how great Is our God and oh, we'll see how great, how great is our God. In age to age we stand. In time is in our hands, beginning and the end. Beginning in the end, the God in three in one, Father, Spirit, and Son, the Lion and the Lamb, the Lion and the Lamb. How great is our God! Sing with me, how great. Is our God, and all oh, will see how great, how great is our God, how great is our God. See with me how great is our God, and all oh, will see how great. How great is our God. You're the name of all, of all names. Worthy of all praise. My heart will sing. How great is our God. the name above all names, worthy of all praise, my heart will sing how great is our God, how great is our God. Show us your greatness. Show us your miracles. For those who do not believe in your signs and wonders, show them signs, show them wonders. Show them forgiveness, show them your mercy, your grace like you never have before. 
give them their peace. Give them your peace. I pray that every person that's the sound of my voice to experience your peace, Lord. The same peace that you've shown me, the same peace that you've given me. Praise the mighty Lord Jesus. Thank you. Um, a few announcements before we conclude. As previously reported, Hillside has hired a consultant who has joined us today, Dr. Jerry Krupp. He's been working hard for our church already. And an email from the delegates with information about uh, Dr. Krupp and working with our church has been sent. If anyone has any questions, please feel free to reach out to one of the delegates. Tomorrow, the Board of Administration is having a Zoom meeting with Dr. Krupp and a Zoom link was sent on the 12th. If you cannot find the link, uh, please check with Faith, uh, email her again, but it's at 7 p.m. On Monday, November 30th, Dr. Krupp wants to hear from you, from everyone else. Um, a Sign Up Genius is going to be sent out this week and to reserve your spot to talk directly with a consultant. If you have an opinion to share on the future of our church, if you have an idea of what this church should prioritize, uh, the delegates encourage you to join one of these meetings. There will be a 10 a.m. slot and a 7 p.m. slot offered. Uh, we're trying to limit the number of attendees to eight so everyone has a chance to speak and be heard. Um, and plan on these lasting for about an hour. Again, if you have any questions, um, please feel free to reach out to one of the delegates or to Faith, our church administrator. Uh, since we are meeting today via Zoom, we are suspending the in-person Sunday afternoon prayer time. Thank you for those who have joined that and continue to pray for Hillside and the mission of our church. Um, thank you, Pastor Tim, for your message today. Today is Christ the King Sunday, and the last Sunday after Pentecost before Advent starts. So make sure to continue to check in and join us next Sunday, the first Sunday of Advent, as we prepare our hearts for our King and Savior. Thursday is Thanksgiving, and I thank you, Pastor Tim, for your message of Thanksgiving and giving thanks. And while we live through a pandemic, economic downturn, and food insecurity throughout our nation, this church has much to celebrate and be thankful for. And we see the fruits and blessings of that today via Zoom worshiping together with all of your faces. Um, today I'm including, it's a, a bit of a longer uh, benediction. I. I, I included verse three, because it reminded us that we are blessed as we read the Bible, but we can speak it out loud. And um, it's a blessing to speak the words that uh, were given to us um, and also blessing those who hear the words. So uh, let us conclude today with a blessing from Revelation chapter one, verses three through eight. Blessed is the one who reads the words of the prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it and take to heart what is written in it, because the time is near. Greetings and doxology. John, to the seven churches in the province of Asia, grace and peace to you from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. To him who loves us and who has freed us from our sins by his blood and has made us to be a kingdom and priests, 
to serve his God and Father. To him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Look, he is coming with the clouds and every eye will see him. Even those who pierced him and all the peoples of the earth will mourn because of him. So shall it be. Amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Amen. Go in peace. Thank you.